So for this lesson, uh, what I want you to do is, is start off considering sort of the following. Uh, every morning you drink orange juice from Florida, you drink coffee whose beans come from Brazil, the needs, I'm sorry, the news that you watch is filmed in New York City, and you watch it on a television made in China. Your clothes come from cotton that is grown in Georgia, sewn together in Thailand, and then shipped all the way back to the United States. <clears throat> your car, uh, as it turns out, comes from all over the world. In fact, it might even be the case that a foreign-made car contains more American-made parts than an American-made car. And your textbook uh, was written by a guy who lives in Massachusetts, printed on paper in Ohio on paper from Oregon. And so what, the, what this is basically getting at is, is something that we've talked about you know, sort of in, in the last two lessons about how complex the world actually is. And if you think about it, you depend upon the collective efforts of millions of people around the world every single day. These are people that you have likely never and will never meet, and frankly, you probably never even thought about them before today, right? So in typical American fashion, right, we take for granted the efforts of millions of people around the world uh, that benefit us and that, frankly, without whom uh, we would be nowhere near as wealthy as we are today. And so why do these people help you? Right? Clearly you don't know them, and they certainly don't know you, so why do they bother? And the answer for why they do so is because it's in their own self-interest to do so. And so this reminds us of, of Adam Smith's famous quote from page two of The Wealth of Nations. It is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from regard to their own self-interest. Right. And Adam Smith saw that in 1776, and it remains true today. And so why do people trade with one another? Or why do nations trade with one another? Why don't we as the U.S. just do everything ourselves? Why bother buying foreign oil, shoes, cars, candy, electronics, and all those things? Surely we could make those things ourselves, right? And in truth, there's no reason why the U.S. couldn't produce any of those things. We certainly could get all the oil that we need. We could make our shoes ourselves and all sorts of other things. So why don't we? Why depend on others when we can depend on ourselves instead? The answer lies in the concept of comparative advantage. And so let's go through some of these, uh, some examples of this. And so when I first moved uh, to Michigan, I lived with two of my good friends, uh, Lewis and Jill. And like any social scientist, all I did was observe them, right? I just observed and saw what they did over the course of their lives. Now, Lewis and Jill are a happily married couple, uh, you know, excellent, right? And so I lived in their house for a little while until I found a place of my own. And so I noticed that throughout the day, Lewis and Jill uh, could make pizza or they could clean rooms. Okay, and so let's just diagram this. And so over the course of the day, <clears throat> you know, these are these numbers are certainly not accurate, but they, they get at the magnitudes, I guess you could say. And so uh, Lewis, over the course of the day, could make, let's say, five pizzas, or he could clean ten rooms. Uh, Jill, on the other hand, could make eight pizzas, uh, but she could only clean four rooms, right? <clears throat> and so one question we might want to ask uh, is who should do what? Who should make the pizza, and who should clean the rooms? Now, uh, what this is saying is that over the course of the day, Lewis could clean uh, 10 rooms or make five pizzas. He can't do both. He can't make uh, 10 rooms clean and make five pizzas. He could do uh, any combination or any linear combination of the two. So he could make, let's say, two and a half pizzas and clean five rooms, right? So he could do that. Uh, his wife, Jill, uh, she could make eight pizzas or clean four rooms, right? Or any linear combination thereof. She could say, spend half her day making pizza and half her day cleaning rooms, and she'd have four pizzas and two clean rooms, okay? 
So now let's ask the question, who should do what? So intuitively, what do you think? Who should do what? Okay. <clears throat> now the answer in this case might seem fairly obvious. Uh, Jill is better at making pizza than Lewis is. And Lewis, uh, owing to the fact that he owns a, a yacht detailing company, uh, is better at cleaning rooms than Jill is. <clears throat> and so it seems to make sense that Jill should make the pizza and Lewis should clean the rooms. Okay? And this answer uh, is 100% correct. Okay? There's nothing wrong with that answer. It's perfectly correct. <clears throat> but I, fortunately, I spent uh, several days with Lewis and Jill. And so I observed them doing other things. And so let's look at other forms of activity. So let's say there's folding laundry, and there's baking cookies. All right, so apparently the tradition in their neighborhood, uh, or at least in one of their families, is that when you move in, uh, you bake cookies for all the neighbors, right? Um, unfortunately, <clears throat> Lewis is absolutely terrible at folding laundry despite his yacht detailing company and he could only get through let's say two loads of laundry over the course of the day and I watched Lewis try to make cookies and it wasn't exactly pleasant uh, and so he could only make let's say two batches of cookies in a day <clears throat> Jill on the other hand uh, is a wizard at folding laundry she knows that trick where like you grab like the two points and you flip them and you fold instantly so let's say Jill could get through uh, 12 loads of laundry in a day, uh, or she could bake six cookies, right? <clears throat> what about this answer? Who should fold the laundry and who should bake the cookies, right? Now, uh, clearly, Jill is better at folding laundry than Lewis is, and she's also better at baking cookies, right? So, should she just do both of these things and let Lewis sit around on his butt drinking uh, Coca-Cola and flying his drones, right? Of course not. Right? There's still gains from trade to be found here. And so how do we find the answer to who should do what? Well, the answer lies in what we call comparative advantage. <clears throat> and what we notice is that for every batch of cookies that Lewis makes, he gives, gives up folding one load of laundry. So for Lewis, let's write this over here. For Lewis, one batch of cookies costs one laundry and one laundry costs one cookie or one cookies right <clears throat> and for Jill One cookie, or one batch of cookies, costs her, right, how many laundries? Well, for that, we want to divide both of these by six, gives us one here and one half, I'm sorry, two over here. So it costs her two laundry. <clears throat> and one laundry. costs Jill half of a batch of cookies, right? And so who gives up the least number of cookies to fold laundry, right? So Lewis has to give up one batch of cookies to fold one laundry. Jill, on the other hand, only has to give up half of a batch of cookies to fill laundry. And so we would say that Jill has a comparative advantage in folding laundry over Lewis because she gives up fewer batches of cookies. Now when it comes to baking cookies, Lewis has to give up one load of laundry, whereas Jill has to give up two loads of laundry. And so we would say that Lewis has a comparative advantage in baking cookies over Jill because he gives up fewer loads of laundry per batch of cookies in order to do so. <clears throat> and so what this should remind you of is the concept of opportunity cost. Right? 
which is saying that for every batch of cookies, Lewis or Jill must sacrifice some number of folded laundry. <clears throat> right, <clears throat> and so what comparative advantage is talking about is who has the lowest opportunity cost of production. So comparative advantage is whoever has the lowest opportunity cost of producing you know, whatever X is <clears throat> has a comparative advantage in producing X. All right. So comparative advantage again is whoever has the lowest opportunity cost of producing X, folding laundry, baking cookies, making pizza, cleaning the rooms, whatever, right? Whoever has the lowest opportunity cost of producing X has a comparative advantage in producing X. Now we also have a concept which we call an absolute advantage. <clears throat> Which is uh, when someone can produce more X than the other person. Right. So in this case, right, Jill has an absolute advantage in folding laundry because 12 is bigger than 2. And she also has an absolute advantage in baking cookies because 6 is bigger than 2. Right? In this example, Jill has a compa I'm sorry, an absolute advantage in producing pizza because 8 is bigger than 5, and Lewis has an absolute advantage in, cl in cleaning rooms because 10 is bigger than 4, right? And so there, absolute advantage is comparing up and down, while comparative advantage is comparing uh, left and right, okay? <clears throat> so let's do uh, some other examples. So let's say uh, we've got uh, me, so we'll have Dave, and we've got Starbucks. And as it turns out, uh, we can either make coffee or uh, give econ talks. Okay. And so over the course of the day, if I really tried hard, I bet I could make a hot, or 10 pots of coffee. Right? Starbucks, on the other hand, can make 100. Okay? <clears throat> over the course of the day, I can give uh, four econ talks, let's say, because I have four classes this semester. Okay? Uh, and Starbucks, if they really put their heads together, I bet they could produce at least one economics lecture. And so uh, I have an absolute advantage in giving economics talks because I can do more of them than Starbucks can. And they have an absolute advantage in producing coffee because they can grow or produce more pots of coffee per day than I can. But let's go through and see what our comparative advantages are. Right? So for, uh, for me, one coffee costs 
how many talks. Okay, so to solve this, I would divide this by 10, and I divide this by 10, and I would get 0 0.4, right? <clears throat> and for me, one talk costs how many coffee? All right, so I divide by four, I divide by four, uh, that is 2.5, right? And so for me, one econ talk means that I sacrifice brewing two and a half pots of coffee, right? And for Starbucks, one coffee costs how many talks? Right. Well, I divide by 100, I divide by 100, and I've got 0 0.01, right? A hundredth of a talk. And for them, one talk costs 100 pots of coffee. Okay, so now, when we want to find who has a comparative advantage, <clears throat> we need to compare who gives up the fewest number of talks to produce a pot of coffee, right? So uh, I have to give up 0 0.4 or 4 tenths of a coffee to make one, two, I'm sorry, 0.4 talks to make one coffee. Starbucks only has to give up a hundredth of a talk to make one coffee. And so we would say that Starbucks has a comparative advantage in brewing coffee Right, because 0 0.01 is smaller than 0 0.4. Likewise, uh, we would say that I have a comparative advantage in giving economics talks because one talk only costs me two and a half pots of coffee, whereas it costs Starbucks a hundred pots of coffee. And so my opportunity cost of giving economics talks is significantly smaller than theirs, and so I have a comparative advantage in giving economics talks. Now you might notice something uh, a little interesting. For one, if I were to multiply these two numbers together or these two numbers together, I would get one, right? This number is the reciprocal of this number, right? Or uh, this, so we could say uh, we have you know, x and we have its reciprocal, 1 over x, right? This is 4 tenths, and this is 10 fourths, right? This is 1 one hundredth, and this is uh, 100, right? Well, this is 100 over 1, and this is 100. And as we all know, uh, if I multiply x times 1 over x, I just get 1, right? So if I tell you something like, one talk costs me 10 fourths of a coffee, and you don't know anything up here, you can automatically fill this number in and know that this is gonna be 4 tenths, right? And the same thing down here. If I tell you that one talk costs Starbucks 100 coffees, you automatically know that one coffee costs them a hundredth of a talk by virtue of this over here, right? And what you also might notice is that in cases where one group, say Starbucks, has an absolute advantage in one good, and the other group, say me, has an absolute advantage in the other one, it follows that our comparative advantages are the same. So if we have different absolute advantages, we have the same comparative advantage. Right? So if you see a case like that on an exam or on a problem set, you can solve it very quickly and know who has the comparative advantage in what. Um, and you can also note, or one question that you might also be asking is, is it possible to have a comparative advantage in both making coffee and giving econ talks? In other words, is there some number that I could put in one of these two spots that would make Starbucks have a comparative advantage in both coffee and giving economics talks? And the answer is actually no. And so what that says is that everyone on Earth has a comparative advantage in something. The question is, what is it? 
right? So each and every one of us has their has our own comparative advantage over everyone else by virtue of just sheer existence. We have demonstrated that, right? Which is an amazingly encouraging thing. So this this idea that economics is a dismal science is patently false. Everyone has a comparative advantage in something. You might not know what it is yet, but you have it, and it's there. You just have to figure it out. And so life is at some level a journey of discovering our own comparative advantages. Okay, let's do, um, let's see, let's do another example. And so let's say we have uh, two farms, we'll call it uh, four winds farm, and let's say we have uh, Perry Farms, a Perry Farm, right? And let's say they can grow corn or soybeans, okay? And let's say four winds can grow 100 units of corn or 500 units of soybeans. And Perry Farms can grow 50 units of corn or 200 units of soybeans. And so if we look at this, Four Winds Farm has an absolute advantage in both producing corn and soybeans. So we can't instantly know what their comparative advantages are. So we're going to have to do it the long way. And so let's go through it. So Four Winds Farm, okay, for them, one corn costs how many soybeans? Okay, so I divide by 100, divide by 100, I get 5. And one soybean costs how many corn? Okay, so we can just do the reciprocal, so 1 over 5. Or we can do it up here. So five divided, 500 divided by 100 is 1 over 5. Perry Farms, 1 corn costs how many soybeans? All right, so 1 corn, so divide by 50, divide by 50, we get 4. And 1 soybean Cost. Well, since this is four, we know this is one fourth of a corn. So let's let's figure it out. One corn costs five soybeans, or one corn costs four soybeans. So it sounds like Perry Farm has the comparative advantage in growing corn. They are the lowest opportunity cost producer of corn. And Four Winds Farm has the comparative advantage uh, in growing soybeans because one fifth is smaller than one fourth, right? And so this is how we can model basically everything. We can talk about the production of any number of goods, or any two goods uh, simply, but any number of goods realistically, using this sort of framework. And we can change these, right? We can change Four Winds Farm and Perry Farm to say the US and Mexico. And we can use it to talk about international trade. And so here, if I did that, right, then we would say that uh, the US has a comparative advantage in growing soybeans and Mexico has a comparative advantage in growing corn. And so even though the US could grow more corn than Mexico, they still would benefit from trading with Mexico for soybeans for corn. And so we can use this to describe why nations trade. They produce along their comparative advantages and trade for things that they don't have a comparative advantage in. Right? But we'll see uh, more of that in the next lesson. We'll go through uh, how that trading process works and why it works in the next lesson.